So, so let's move ahead with this uh, first uh, presentation. And so I, I think that uh, it's key these days, uh, since we are always trying to treat myeloma early uh, and avoid complications from myeloma, uh, what is the story with smoldering myeloma and, and where are we in our ability to, to catch the myeloma really early at a point where maybe it's a high-risk smoldering myeloma where we think that there is a high chance uh, and what that means is a 70 to 80 percent chance of active myeloma within the coming uh, uh, year and a half or so. So next slide. So, so I think that uh, a very, very key uh, point right now, uh, and it's uh, a point that uh, uh, many patients have been interested in, is when should treatment be initiated? When should treatment be uh, started? And so obviously, if there are uh, any myeloma-defining events. Now, uh, the new diagnostic criteria indicate that if uh, there's a 60% level of plasma cells in the bone marrow, if there's a, more than one lesion on an MRI, and if the free light ratio is uh, is greater than 100. So these, these events, uh, even in the absence of actual uh, symptoms or signs of myeloma, are sufficient to recommend starting treatment. Uh, but obviously, um, uh, the, the, the standard criteria are, uh, you know, elevated calcium, uh, kidney problems, uh, anemia, and of course, uh, uh, bone lesion. So any of those would uh, lead to a start of treatment uh, for myeloma. But what we've been looking at more closely is uh, what about if there are no myeloma-defining events, if the, um, the levels of plasma cells and uh, free light levels are, are a little bit lower, for example, uh, at what point would we call it high-risk smoldering myeloma and possibly think about starting treatment? And then on the opposite side, uh, how clearly can we say that someone has definitely got uh, low risk uh, small, smoldering myeloma and uh, does not need to be uh, treated in the short term? And so uh, the key things that have been looked at uh, in the last uh, two or three years are uh, the components of what are called the, the 2020 system. And so in this system, uh, the cutoff for high-risk uh, smoldering myeloma uh, is if the myeloma protein level in the blood is uh, greater than two grams per deciliter, if the percentage of plasma cells is 20% uh, uh, or higher, and if the free light ratio is uh, uh, 20 or higher. And so uh, it's a uh, uh, lower cutoffs than for the current myeloma-defining events. And so uh, based on recent analysis, uh, uh, these are patients who are also at a higher risk of early uh, progression. Uh, next slide. And so uh, uh, what is recommended if you might fall into this higher risk group where we're uh, anticipating that myeloma could evolve in the coming months? Uh, is it still okay just to observe for now? Uh, perhaps uh, based on uh, trials from Spain and from the Eastern Oncology Group, uh, maybe uh, using Revlimid or Revlimid and Dex could be used to prevent progression. Or maybe uh, it's a better idea if we really are thinking that myeloma will develop to treat it like myeloma or even using uh, a curative type uh, uh, approach. Uh, and so this, at the present time, in the absence of randomized trial data, is, is very much a, a personal uh, uh, decision. Uh, and uh, we also need to keep in mind that uh, as for um, uh, myeloma itself, uh, there can be uh, patients who are more elderly or fragile. And so Maybe for them, if, if treatment was considered, uh, Revlimid or Revlimid Dex could be uh, considered. But for a younger, uh, fit patient, uh, it's a lot easier to think about uh, myeloma therapy uh, or even a curative approach. And uh, there are um, uh, trials ongoing to look at that. Uh, for the, the cure type therapy, there is the 
ASCENT trial, which is going on right now, uh, which is the DARA KRD uh, approach. Uh, and so uh, this is an evolving area and certainly something to um, talk uh, carefully with your uh, doctor about. Next slide. Uh, but what we're going to be uh, talking about today uh, is, is the management of myeloma, which has these uh, standard uh, components. Uh, you have the initial therapy, and then uh, for patients who are eligible, they uh, will still most likely proceed to autologous stem cell transplant followed by maintenance. For older patients or those not eligible for transplant, uh, they might receive some consolidation followed by uh, maintenance. And of course, all these patients uh, will be receiving supportive care with, with for example, bone therapy uh, with uh, 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 Zomeda or uh, with uh, the, um, the new monoclonal antibody that can be an, an alternative. Uh, uh, I just reference here um, every year, uh, Dr. Vincent Rajkumar has a really excellent overview of management of myeloma, which is a, a very, very good uh, reference uh, source. Uh, next slide. And so uh, I, I think that the 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 key thing to be aware of, and one of the most important reasons for having uh, a patient and family seminars like this is that uh, we have uh, moved from the old days to the new days where now there are so many options, both in the frontline setting and then moving forward through uh, maintenance uh, to the relapse session, uh, uh, the relapse um, setting. And so you can see over on the right, there are so many uh, uh, drugs that have been approved and are available. If we start <clears throat> on the left in the frontline setting, I think that for now, as we'll touch on in just a second, a triplet, particularly VRD, is definitely the standard of care. <clears throat> and as we talked about, uh, uh, perhaps converting that into a four drug combination uh, along with DARA is, is something which is uh, more frequently considered. Uh, over on the right, we're going to be hearing a lot about uh, these uh, newer agents, particularly the ones at the bottom of the list. Uh, Melflufen was just recently approved. Belantamab uh, uh, just recently approved. Blenref we were just talking about. And prior to that, Selenexor was just recently approved. And so these are the, the, the newest ones that are available uh, and will be a focus for uh, discussion, uh, I'm sure. Next slide. And so I think that um, uh, th this is a trial w which I led, but actually it does highlight uh, the way forward for uh, current approaches to therapy. The SWOG trial, uh, the, the 777 trial, which was started um, in, uh, in 2007, and so this is a trial which has been running for over uh, 10 years now, uh, was the first one to show uh, in an ongoing fashion that starting off with three drugs, the Valcade, Revlimid, and Dex, versus just the two drugs, Revlimid and Dex, led to both uh, improved remissions and overall survival. And this has been a template for many newer studies uh, 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 here recently, uh, and also the template for looking at four drugs versus uh, three drugs, for example. Next slide. And so just to, just to show you, I think that it's uh, very, very important, especially for uh, a newly diagnosed patient, to be aware that with the long-term follow-up of, of VRD with, with this uh, triplet that in the SWOG trial, where we have over 10 years of follow-up now, um, that uh, the initial remission was in that three-and-a-half-year range, and that uh, the overall survival uh, is uh, one in which 55% uh, of the patients are alive at seven years. And so this is a, 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 a substantial improvement uh, in terms of outcomes uh, versus what we have seen in, uh, in the past. Next slide. And so when we're thinking about myeloma therapy and uh, what we're going to be talking about during the, the day today is this question of using three drugs versus four drugs in the frontline setting, and then uh, using maintenance after that, 
uh, and how that might be modified based upon uh, chromosome genetic testing uh, uh, done at, at baseline where um, it might be uh, recommended to consider uh, using a proteasome inhibitor in addition to Revlimid. And then the approach to relapse that we're going to be hearing about, uh, a more decisive approach to relapse because excellent results can be obtained, uh, especially if a triplet is used and it's feasible. And then, of course, the emerging very powerful impact of all of the new uh, immune uh, therapies. Next slide. So that kind of sets the stage for, for today uh, as we move forward. Uh, just a, a few summary comments about COVID, since there are just so many uh, anxieties and concerns about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, next slide. So to be very, very clear, I think that we've talked about what is the response to the vaccination in patients with myeloma. And probably it is uh, somewhat suboptimal, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't get vaccinated. It's uh, very, very important to get vaccinated as soon as you can with whatever uh, vaccine is available to you, if that be the Pfizer, the Moderna, or the recently approved uh, one, uh, one-time dose J&J uh, &J vaccine. And so uh, I think that uh, even if there is a suboptimal uh, response, what we know is that it is probably uh, good enough to really reduce uh, the risk of developing severe disease, which is what we're trying to avoid for every uh, myeloma patient. And also uh, that this is just the first step to protect both the patient and uh, the disease in the community. And we're expecting that uh, booster shots of some type will be uh, introduced later in the year. Uh, for myeloma patients, uh, no, stay on this slide, yes. Uh, should continue to wear masks in public settings. Uh, I, absolutely, I recommend that. And it's still not safe to be uh, traveling on planes or trains because uh, there are just too many people around that you could uh, uh, com have contact with uh, where you could have a chance of being exposed uh, to uh, infection. Uh, small protected gatherings are okay. Uh, getting together with grandkids if you've been vaccinated. Some of these things that have been in the news these uh, last uh, few days. Next slide. Yeah, and so uh, some of the strategies uh, to reduce uh, risk during the crisis, obviously many of you have been using uh, telemedicine uh, to avoid uh, some uh, clinic visits and uh, perhaps limiting uh, lab testing or getting lab testing done locally. Uh, maybe, redu maybe you did reduce the number of doses of getting the uh, uh, Zomeda uh, and uh, be more cautious about uh, low blood counts. As we were discussing, we don't want you to be having low blood counts, uh, neutropenia, especially if we're wanting you to have uh, vaccination. Uh, and uh, maybe consider oral drugs versus IV drugs. Uh, and uh, be, be especially cautious about uh, DARA because of the reduction in the immune system. Uh, and uh, uh, as we mentioned, as, as, as Rafat emphasized, uh, uh, just, just be aware of that. Um, be aware that uh, clinical trials are still going on, although um, uh, there are different priorities at, at different uh, centers. and, and uh, trials may be uh, modified uh, based on the COVID-19. Next slide. Yes. Uh, one of the key things is just to be aware of different things that are okay. And obviously, uh, going out and about with your mask on is strongly encouraged. Go for a walk. And uh, if you need to see the dentist, it's definitely okay that the, the setup in dentist offices has really been uh, tightened up considerably, and uh, it is mostly uh, quite safe to get uh, routine dental work uh, performed. Next slide. But the big, big thing right now, which is affecting all of us, is uh, pandemic fatigue. Uh, this, I'm just using this uh, phrase. Uh, it really has been a long, long haul this last year being locked down, uh, being limited uh, with social contacts. And this is a real, real issue for everyone. 
And so to avoid problems, it's so important to reach out to family and friends on a regular basis. Uh, try actively to find ways to de-stress. Uh, you can go uh, on a, a virtual tour of, uh, of the art museum or what is uh, even uh, funnier is, is to look at the penguins from the shed aquarium where they are allowed out and about once a week now and they actually went to the art museum in Chicago and watching them go to the art museum is <coughs> especially funny. <coughs> Uh, and I strongly recommend clicking on that video. There's a whole series of them once a week. Uh, but we all need to try to be stronger, and it is important to try to work on your resilience. So uh, We're not going to be resilient every day, uh, but uh, we had a, a, a living well call with Dr. Sue Dunnett from the University of Edinburgh, where she talked about how we can uh, focus on this and try to build your resistance during these difficult times. Uh, as I said, you're not going to be resilient every day and, and don't expect that. But if you work at it slowly, it is helpful to try to build it up, uh, physical resilience so that you have good strength, but also mental uh, resilience and uh, reducing uh, stress. Mm -hmm. Next slide. For the support groups, many of you have been participating with your virtual support groups, and uh, Susie and I have been participating in those, a number of those, and these, I think, have been especially helpful to overcome this fatigue and allow people to connect. Uh, next slide. I think we have some more pictures. Yeah, so you can see that this has really helped people to really connect and learn, but, but to stay socially connected right now, which has been crucial. Next slide. And so we will get through this together. We will get through this together. Myeloma has no borders and uh, nature is uh, a reminder, a constant reminder that life goes on. Uh, and as David Hockney said uh, earlier last year, remember, uh, they can't cancel the spring. And he, he was talking about this as the daffodils were, were popping up despite the emergence of, of the pandemic. And so uh, nature is a big, big reminder of, of the resilience that surrounds us every day. Next slide. And so the pandemic is, uh, is a big problem and, and we certainly want to work to prevent it from uh, happening again. It's, it's complicated, uh, but standard preventive pre precautions work. Wearing a mask is so, so helpful. Uh, we need to adjust your myeloma care, but we really want to focus on making sure you still do get your care. Uh, as we said, there will be a long-term impact, which mostly will be a need for ongoing vaccination, uh, I think, uh, for sure. Next slide. And so we, uh, we, we have uh, different seminars for the newly diagnosed and for COVID and uh, many, many different sources of information and uh, we to take advantage uh, of those.